Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's 11.02, and some people may be joining us uh, as we go along. So I uh, just want to thank everybody for coming out. We, we're really excited about presenting this material. So again, this is Casey Smith. Um, go ahead and introduce uh, who's going to be presenting today. So my name is Casey Smith. I'm the Director of Applied Research here at Red Canary. And prior to joining Red Canary, I did some red team work and also worked for a large financial organization. Turn it over to you, Mike. Awesome. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Michael Haig. I've uh, been with Red Canary for about a year and a half now, and I'm the Director of Advanced Threat Detection and Research. Um, prior to that, I worked at a Fortune 150 and helped secure the organization. So I'm really, uh, really excited to get this project out there more and to talk about it here today. Awesome. Okay, just a couple of things for housekeeping. This is going to be just a little bit different than maybe other webinars, but some things are going to be pretty standard. So uh, for, just make sure everybody knows you're in listen-only mode. So if you do have questions, please type those in the chat um, box that you have uh, as we go along. And we will be taking questions via the chat as we do the webinar. And also throughout the um, demonstrations, we have breakpoints where you can ask us questions about the specific labs that we've just demonstrated. Um, there will be follow-up email if we don't get to any questions that come out. You'll also get a, a, a link to the recording and you'll get a copy of the slides. So if you have questions on that, please let us know. So with that, I think we're ready to go ahead and jump in. So just a brief overview of what we're going to look at for learning objectives. We want to share with you what we're calling the atomic red team tests. What are they? How do they actually work? And then we're presenting three lab-based scenarios. We want this to be really interactive and hands-on and have you come away with something that you can test in your own environment. Uh, important disclaimer, before you ever run any of the tests that we're demonstrating, make sure you have permission because a lot of these tests that we're demonstrating mimic adversarial activity. So this is definitely something you would not just want to type out and run on your environment. Make sure you've got permission to test your infrastructure before you run any of our scenarios that we're presenting. Okay, so the three labs we're going to do will be a RedSurf32 lab, a basic test, then we'll look at a chain reaction, which is the process of taking multiple techniques and stitching them together to emulate more advanced adversary actions. And then Mike's going to take us through some uh, measurement and progress. Uh, how do you actually know if you're gaining ground as a defender running these types of tests? Uh, I'll point out uh, any links and references here. All of the code was on our GitHub repo, which I'll be showing you in just a moment. So with that, I think we're ready to go ahead and get in to lab one. So lab one is going to be a RedSurf32 lab. We're going to talk about what this technique is, uh, how you can detect it, and then we'll answer any questions at the end. So let me go ahead and jump into my lab VM. Should be seeing my desktop at this point. So brief overview. We want to make sure it's very clear that we give a shout out to the MITRE ATT&CK team that's developed this framework. Uh, we use this because we feel like it's a very extensive catalog of post-exploitation techniques. So this is certainly not something Red Canary has created, but we want to drive you guys to make sure you're aware of the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And we're going to build our test case based on their published work. So we want to make sure you understand where the source of this information comes from. It's open, available for you to use. So we encourage you to, to check this out uh, afterwards. As far as atomic red team tests go, where you can find this is on the Red Canary atomic red team GitHub page. And this is here in the browser. You can browse to this. Uh, feel free to look at this as we go through this if you have questions. But what we've designed here is a way to take the MITRE framework and we've tried to align our test cases with the MITRE framework. So for example, if we wanted to look at a technique called the Red Serve 32, we could browse into the MITRE framework, go into the execution tab, and we could browse down to where the actual Red Serve 32 event is and look at the details for this particular attack. You'll notice it falls into two different uh, tactics, a defensive a evasion and execution. So we can click on that. We can see all the details. Everything you'd want to know is really nicely, succinctly cataloged here uh, on the MITRE attack page. Now, how would we actually map this in the atomic framework? So again, our catalog follows the same flow. So you would go into Windows. We could then browse into the execution tab and then we could take a look at the technique that we're looking at, and you'll find Red Serve 32 here. We have some cross mappings, so if you're curious about how that works, you want to go back to the framework, you can do that here. And we've tried to provide a very brief overview of what the test case is, and then we've provided sample scripts on how to actually execute the test. And that's what an atomic test is, really distilled down to very simply what the technique is, 
and how do you test it to seed your logs and make sure your detections are actually working because that's really the goal of this is to make sure that whatever tool or um, software you're using to detect attacks in your environment if you run an attack you want to make sure that your telemetry is being collected and analyzed properly so with that we'll go ahead and get into one of the atomic tests and so the first one we're calling lab one is just a basic red serve 32 lab all of these scripts will be published on the Git repo uh, after this, so you don't have to recreate these. But in all honesty, they're just batch files. So we're just keeping it very basic at this point. So we think you should be able to create these pretty easily. In this lab, we're going to go back to the test case, and we've got a payload here called redserve32.sct. I'll talk about what an SCT file is in just a minute, but if I bring up the payload that we're actually going to test, you can see some details about the attack, but ultimately here on line 18, we're just going to be running calc, and all of this is fully customizable for you guys to run something or chain things together, which we'll get into in lab two. Okay, so on with the attack. This has become fairly popular attack technique over the last year. Uh, let's break this down of what's happening. So RedSurf32 is a default tool inside of Windows. So it's been with Windows since like Windows XP all the way through to Windows 10. So we're going to use this command to actually execute a payload from the internet. And that's why this is really attractive. It, it works as both a application whitelisting bypass or uh, other endpoint telemetry bypass. Uh, hopefully you're catching this, but we want to make sure that you're able to test your log with these atomic tests. So RedSurf32 is the binary. Go ahead, Mike. Out of I was going to say, out of curiosity, Casey, how did you end up coming across this sort of on your own in the wild? How are you reviewing to get to this place? Oh, sure. So just some background. Yeah, good question. So some of you may or may not be aware. This is a technique uh, that I blogged about about a year ago uh, and just, just found a way to execute something remotely in an environment that was pretty locked down with whitelisting, and I wanted to be able to execute a script. Uh, and so I came across this just looking at some of the default binaries that were available and, and found that you can register a comm scriptlet using this tool, uh, even though that's really not your objective. Your end goal would be to execute some command or payload. But that, this, this tool uh, really surfaced as a really nice way for as a red teamer at the time I was working on uh, as a way to evade some of the uh, defensive techniques that I was going up against, if that makes sense. Awesome. That's awesome. Yep. So yeah, just to kind of continue on, so slash s is suppressing any error messages. So we're going to hide uh, anything that may be popping up or prompting the user that there was an error. Slash u is actually a really interesting part of this attack because what this is saying is when we run this command, unregister the code that's in the scriptlet. So if you look at the payload here, you can see that there's a registration block. And that falls between like line 22 and line 3. And so whatever falls in here, you're telling RedSurf32, unregister this thing. And the reason that's attractive for uh, attackers is because it doesn't leave any artifacts in the registry. It doesn't leave anything um, registered on disk. It will leave the temporary file downloaded, which I'll talk about in a minute. But this is kind of nice because uh, it lets you run something without actually putting, uh, a, you know, sort of tattooing the registry or persisting in the machine in some method. So. Um, the next, the next command is slash i, and slash i is simply a parameter to redserv32, and this is where we actually pass the URL that we want to be executing uh, into the system. And then at the very end, we have the DLL, scrobga.dll, which is going to be, essentially think of this like a scripting environment or script host. This is the thing that's really going to do the execution for us or the heavy lifting. So this is a common attack. Uh, all of these different variables then are going to generate telemetry in your network. So you're going to have things like command line arguments you could look for, like slash s, slash u, slash i. You may be looking for scrob j on the command line. You may be looking for an SCT file. Although be aware, this extension doesn't really matter. It could be anything. We've seen JPEG or PNG. What actually matters is that the payload over here is a properly structured XML document. Okay. So, so Casey, this yep. this can go both ways, right? We could we could run this SCT file locally and on the network side, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, the, you know, a sim simple way to run this, if you wanted to, uh, if you had, uh, let's say, you had an SCT local, 
let's say I down so in this in this screenshot I've downloaded the atomic repo and I go to execution and or actually rather payload sorry and I've got an SCT file here you could actually right click and just say unregister I'll just do it <laughs> why not now it'll pop a message and pop calc but that's why the attackers like the slash s they don't want that to show up and so then we get the payload so it certainly could be run locally or uh, off of a network share that's exactly right that's awesome so again one of the things we're going to do we're going to go ahead and run this test and then we're going to look at and confirm that our endpoint tele telemetry collection is actually seeing uh, these events so let's go ahead and just run it like I said these are all just batch files, so I could copy and paste, or in this example, I'm just going to go ahead and run the Red Canary Labs 1 bat file that contains the very basic atomic test. Red Sur 32 reaches out to the internet, calc pops, crowd goes wild. Um, but let's dive in and see what actually happened uh, in our log collection when this attack was generated, if that makes sense. Casey, before we hop into that, we got one pretty good question here. I'll, I'll run yeah, past right. Yep. Um, so why would you unregister and not register it? Okay, good question. So yeah, this is something I dove into when I was researching this method. Uh, if you actually register that scriptlet, it, it's actually going to create registry keys that that a defender could come along and pick up. So the really the really amazing thing that I think that when I found this was that by putting the slash u command on the command line. It says I want to unregister, even though it doesn't live on the machine, but it will execute the code thinking there's something you want to execute there that you need to unregister. So uh, hopefully that helps answer the question. But yeah, it's a really good question. Like, I'm not unregistering anything. I'm actually just using that to gain a, a path into the uh, XML file to execute the code. Uh, hopefully that helps answer the question. And um, if I need to follow up on that, I can later. So. Awesome. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then on, as you're loading up the event log there, yeah. um, are there other types of, of DLLs that you can run with Red Serve 32? So you got ScrubJ there. Is there is there anything else that can kind of run off the end right there? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. I've certainly seen um, – so the, the way the, the attack actually works is you're, you're actually passing slash I into whatever DLL that you're running. And so um, – I think I, I think I actually bookmarked this mine. Hold on one second. So if you look at like slash these parameters that are passed to regserv32, slash i is just calling a DLL install method inside of your DLL. So if you created a specially crafted DLL and then pass slash i, you could pass whatever parameters you want. Uh, and uh, the drawback to that from an attacker perspective means you'd have to leave your custom DLL on disk and uh, you know, uh, there's there's risk there, but certainly there's there's other attackers using other DLLs that have different payloads. If that answers the question, does that make sense? Yep, that's perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a bunch of events. In this example, we're just using uh, Sysmon. Mike's going to go into a little detail of, of some other tools that we can use, but uh, a lot of people use Sysmon. This again is not a Red Canary tool. This is a Microsoft tool. This is from the sys internal suite, and we can see there's a bunch of different uh, activity occurring here. And so, it, as far as running an atomic test, I want to see where did Red Serve 32 actually execute. And I can see a couple of different artifacts that then would be interesting to me as a defender. Uh, I can see Red Serve 32 ran, and I can see that it actually made a network connection. And if we look down here at the bottom pane, we can see that it called out to this IP address over this port using HTTPS. So uh, that's pretty interesting right there, that Red Serve 32 making a network connection. How often does that happen in your environment? And if we drill down a little bit, I think this is the right one, yeah, 11.13. You can actually see the command line that was executed, and you can also see a parent process. And so that could be important. Maybe the parent process was like Microsoft Word or Excel uh, or some other tool. So uh, at, at this point, uh, what I would say is the, you know, the atomic test here for Lab 1 is really complete. We've executed the test. We've seen everything that we executed in the batch file has shown up in our log collection. Uh, at this point, uh, we've completed the steps that we would need for lab one. So uh, hopefully that's helpful information. At this point, I want to pause for just a minute and see if anybody might have any questions on what we just did there.
Yeah, so we, we do have one question here, Casey, um, which I think we, we just talked about this, I think, yesterday, or not yesterday, but last week, was, uh, so kind of what is the, how is RedServ32, when you're loading this with SCR object, uh, SCR ob, ScrobeJ, or squiggly do, <laughs> um, how is it different from run DLL32? Oh, okay, so that's actually uh, probably something we would I'd want to address a little bit later. Um, but just the the short answer would be uh, run DLL thirty two. You specify when you call run DLL thirty two. You specify the DLL that you're running, uh, the method that you're calling, and then any parameters that you want to pass. You can actually run scriptlets from run DLL thirty two using a function called get object. But I'll tell you what I'll do, Mike. Uh, let me. Uh, it's a good question, and uh, we don't have time now to do that. But let me let me follow up with that in the uh, follow up email, so we have the details of why RedSurf32 is different than RunDLL32. And it's actually yeah. I'll probably drive you back to also the MITRE framework. Again, this framework has some good distinctions about different techniques. And so if we look in the MITRE framework, there's actually some additional detail on you know here's RedSurf32. But here's some additional details about run DLL32 that you may want to reference as a starting point to find additional information. Yeah, I believe That's we also point. have uh, I believe we also have a couple atomic tests for run DLL as well. We certainly, yeah, we do. We have some atomic tests that map to that technique for sure. Okay, uh, I think we got another question. So give me just a minute here. Well. Yep, a uh, couple, okay, so we got a few Sysmon okay, questions. Yep. Um, so the EVTX for Sysmon, uh, when you do install it, it loads it into uh, Windows Event Viewer there, or I believe it does, right, Kaser? Do you have to go and pull it in through MMC? Into uh, it, it, no, that's a good question. So um, it did actually, uh, I didn't have to do anything different with Event Viewer. Once Sysmon's installed, the operational logs are available to you there. Uh, and if you wanted to see location of where those logs actually persist, uh, you can see the log path and the log name on properties. Uh, there's some probably some additional configuration for that. I'm not I'm not too familiar with that at this point, but hopefully that helps you see. Like I didn't do anything different with Event Viewer to bring that log window up. If that was the question. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, and then do you do you know? I I don't know if we dug into this enough, but uh, in any other security event logs, just like in the security one. Um, is there anything else within there when we execute Red Surf 32 like this that uh, would trigger some kind of event uh, that we could potentially correlate with Sysmon? That's a good question. I'm not familiar with that. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you know that, Mike. I haven't seen anything in any other logs at this point. Um, I, I'm wondering if there's an error. There may be something in the application log, but I'm speculating on that. I, I think that's a good question yeah. to follow up on if we could identify yeah. other. Uh, areas where Sysmon may, or other logs that have artifacts for RedServe32. That's a great question, actually. Oh, yep. Cool. Yep. Um, so the, there's one question that came in. Is there a big difference when trying to detect this via Sysmon versus EDR solutions? Um, it it kind of goes both ways. You can use Sysmon as a way to um, audit these type of events, right, and drop them into a sim and review them, or use Windows event forwarding to centralize that logging. Uh, then you can hunt through Sysmon data that way. Uh, or if you're using an EDR solution, right, you have similar abilities and capabilities to also create watch lists or some kind of feeds looking for different command variables within that command line. Um, or red serve making a netcon or red serve going to a gist. Um, that's actually one of my favorite ways to catch, catch Casey is looking for uh, command line activity going to GitHub. <laughs> But awesome. uh, yeah, there's definitely kind of multiple ways to do it with, with both of these products. And that's one of the reasons why we highlighted this one today. And we'll, we'll jump into an EDR tool here in a few minutes as well. Cool. Great. Good. Yeah, really good. Some really good questions. So it looks like there's some follow-up on maybe some event codes. We'll, we'll get that uh, out to everybody to make sure we're uh, getting you guys the right info. So thanks for the feedback on that. Really good. Other questions? Or I think we're okay at this point? Or? Yep, I think I think we're going to go ahead and uh, get into lab yeah, two then at this point. Yep. So uh, this is where things get a little bit interesting uh, as far as what we want to what Mike and I have kind of dubbed chain reaction. So keying off this atomic theme. Uh, what if you know? Rarely does a technique occur in isolation. So uh, obviously, what we did there was a very basic test. But how would we actually chain some of these attacks together? 
to then make sure we've got coverage for a sequence of events that might happen in our environment. So let's take a look at this example of a chain reaction. And just a little bit of background on this. Um, there's a lot of other frameworks out there that people are using for testing, and we encourage you to use uh, whatever works best for you. Uh, we're, we're doing something that gives you a lot of flexibility, we think, here. So I, we used the analogy before Mike and I were talking about Lego. So we'll give you the basic building blocks, put them together however you want, uh, and hopefully Mike and I have some, some ideas on things that will sort of emerge later on. But that's really the, the genesis of this idea is to say, here's the small basic test. You can chain them together. Obviously, we're using batch files. You could do PowerShell scripts. You could leverage other frameworks that you might want to use to run these test cases. So uh, it's really your information to do the testing with. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. We think um, you can combine these in some really creative ways. So let's take a look at what I've got here on the screen. So now we're going to take the RedServe32 payload and we'll emulate some very, very basic attacker activity. So an attacker gains ex execution on your environment. They run RedServe32, which we saw in lab one. The next question is, well, what do they do now? So um, a couple of different things that could happen at this point. Uh, and Mike and I have coined the phrase alternate endings. But the first ending that we would say maybe or the next phase of this test would be the attacker enumerates a bunch of different things in your environment. So they're going to run things like uh, enumeration of domain accounts, local administrators, shares, uh, processes that are running network connections and so what you see on line 16 is actually a flattened version of this file that we've got created on the atomic red team called discovery.bat so I just took discovery.bat and flattened it into a single chain of uh, commands using the and sign there's a couple different ways to do this but this is a very simple way to say run this then this then this then this so the first test RedServe32, the second chain, the attacker is going to run a, a long sequence of uh, discovery commands. And then the next chain of attack would be line 21, where we actually can schedule a task, for example, and then run uh, something at a different time. So it's very common for attackers, and if you look back at even the life cycle or the, the flow that MITRE has presented, uh, there's, there's a sequence of these tactics, right? So they gain execution, then the attacker does like privilege escalation or persistence. We're trying to just keep it very basic so you get the idea of where we're headed with the atomic testing. So the flow of this attack would be we have RedServe32, runs some enumeration, runs a scheduled task, and then just for safety and make sure we don't leave anything on a test system, let's go ahead and clean up what we've executed on our, our scheduled task. So. This, is, this will be fun because I think Mike will show you in a minute what this looks like in like an EDR technique. But we'll, we'll go ahead and just uh, talk about two other things, then we'll execute the test. So alternate endings, these are, these are things you can do. So if you want to take it a different way, like another way for an attacker to actually run this command would be to get execution via RedServe32. And then maybe they do a PowerShell downloader and execute uh, discovery.bat in its entirety. Okay, and then they call discovery.bat. So that might be something that happens. Uh, another alternate ending, you might actually run a scheduled task, and we've definitely seen attackers do this, that then call RedServe32 to some other URL with a payload, et cetera. So you can see here we're just popping a command prompt, but you could also put whatever payload in that scheduled task you wanted. So there's some different things that this is going to light up quite a bit for uh, different products that are monitoring the system. You have netcons, you have registry reads, you have uh, persistence with the scheduled task. So again, as far as the actual execution of the, the very basic test, um, we can just run the lab. We can see a bunch of different things happening on the system. And we can then go look in our logs and confirm that all this different activity actually is category or, or catalog rather sorry so uh, while that's happening I'll just go ahead and bring this up uh, and just kind of refresh here and just confirm that everything we're seeing is uh, being uh, created. The nice part about chaining these is it it's beyond even syslon right we're able to because you're querying the domain you're querying different groups and whatnot um, these will generate other event logs so now you have the capabilities to confirm your detection with you know windows event logs and anything that's hitting domain controllers and whatnot Awesome. Yep. So it looks like everything ran. Scheduled task was created. Scheduled task was then subsequently removed. 
that that second phase may not actually happen. Uh, again, so wh while we're showing Sysmon collection, really the the aim of these tests is to be really uh, something that's vendor neutral. So something that would allow you to test different products that you may be evaluating or that you have in your network. So we really don't want these tests to be tied to a particular solution. So just realize Sysmon's great. It's free. It's a good way, way to get started. You may have more advanced capabilities. So uh, you, you can kind of get a feel now for how we're able to chain these different attacks together. So we have a red serve 32 chained with a discovery chained with a persistence. So um, I think we're doing good as far as timing. I, th that's a little bit more advanced uh, sequence. I want to make sure I pause and answer any questions that may be coming in at this point for uh, lab two. So I'll go ahead and just make sure we're good on this. So what, what questions do you have, those of you that are attending on using this chaining technique? And something to, to remember on this is when when you're chaining these, you can add as many of these as you want. I mean, you don't have to make it very, like just three of them like we just did here. I mean, you saw the alternate ending. The idea is to generate the event data, uh, the traffic and whatnot, and begin to go back and peel back the onion and see where, uh, who detected it, which, you know, which products are being effective here. Um, goal is detection and prevention. You want to validate you have detection occurring across your full stack and also Hopefully, something along these along the lines here. We had some type of prevention ha happening, um, yep. good or bad, right? That discovery bat file is really noisy. So hopefully, someone if you have a sock monitoring, hopefully someone in that sock is, you know, ringing all the red bells that someone just profiled an endpoint in a network. <laughs> yep, yep, absolutely. Hopefully so bad. we did actually, yeah, we actually did have a question come in, Mike. Let me just jump in real quick. Uh, we had a question come in. Uh, yeah, okay. Asking, is the chaining technique effective over the long term? And I would probably say, you know, depending on scale, not, you know, probably not, right? Like, as far as like something that you want to maybe build in your models or maturity level would be different ways to automate different testing and, and automate the collection and things like that. So, uh, again, we're just actually getting, you know, trying to get people started. Uh, batch files being the most simple way to do that, but um, hopefully that answers the question. Let's see. Uh, too much data. Oh, so the question came in, was there too much data to store across the full stack? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I, th that's really going to depend on the, the different organizations and what levels that you would collect. I guess maybe Mike could speak to maybe like your Sysmon config was a way to like pare down some of this or tune some of the logging you're getting. Uh, and if we don't need to get into that right now, that's fine. We could follow up with that, but maybe you could speak to that, Mike, just briefly. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's, especially with Sysmon, right? You either collect everything or you filter out a lot of things and you collect specific, you know, tasks that you're executing. Um, in this Sysmon-like world, you may only want to just gather command, PowerShell, WMIC, net, the standard things that actors are using today. And that'll help you get to a degree of visibility of what's happening on endpoints. Um, probably the hardest part from there will be actually digging and reviewing all of that data. And, and that's actually coming up here in lab three where we'll talk about measuring and seeing where you stand and how you progress over time. Um, you know, and then that's sort of where the EDR products come in, right? Whether you're shipping all of Sysmon with Windows event forwarding or you're putting it into some kind of log aggregation solution. Um, confirming you have detection criteria is built into that as well. Um, it's going to take data, it's going to take a lot of information to store. So if you have an EDR tool and if it's collecting things and putting it all in one place, that could help save on that from not having to, you know, blow your Splunk license on 500 gigs a day of additional information. Cool. Awesome. All right. That, thanks, Mike. So that's really good. So I think, um, looks like I don't see any other questions at this point. So. Uh, what a, just a quick recap again, we, we looked at two different techniques. We looked at a simple uh, execution of an event in isolation, and then we chained a couple of these events together. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, and he's going to talk a little bit about what does this look like from the collection and aggregation uh, and measuring standpoint. So I'll go ahead and hand it over, Mike. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Just going to pull that up here. Perfect. All right. Um, once this gets loaded up, 
right now I have us loaded right into carbon black response. Uh, so Red Canary, we do endpoint detection and response using carbon black response. And so in this particular case, as Casey was going through it, and we've been running this quite a bit as well, so we've got lots and lots of data um, from these bat files and all the other things we play with. And so in this particular case, right here, I just have us on the child process from command.exe, spawning RedServe32. And you can see where here, where that command line of downloading uh, that SCT file from our Atomic Red Team repository. Um, and then we have our calc being spawned. And so, again, that's a really good indicator of Casey Smith in your environment, uh, RedServe32 spawning calculator. <laughs> and then being he executed that bat file, you can see all that additional profiling data here. So within what he had executed was that flat was uh, all those different reg queries, a couple different WMIC, WMIC commands here, just gathering data, lots of discovery on the MITRE attack matrix there. So you know, IP config data, and it just keeps going, right? So there's a lot of data that's being gathered. Um, and then being that we had the two red sir 32s as where your second one is. Um, so all of this is generating noise, right? And so you should be able to, you know, depending on your, your maturity within your organization, you can begin to measure and map these things out. Um, and so a huge shout out to Roberto Rodriguez. He built a heat map along, along the lines of the MITRE attack matrix here. And we referenced this on our Atomic Red Team blog post that we had uh, published yeah, a week or so ago now. Um, but this heat map is what we kind of based our, our whole detection criteria off of as well. Um, it allows us to begin to detect where we had, where begin to actually measure exactly what we saw in our environment. Um, and so like in my particular case, I'm going to come up with a random scenario that all I have is carbon black response. I'm not centrally logging anything inside of a sim log aggregation, so nothing centralized. I'm having to physically, not physically, but having to go to my firewall and find out if somebody went to an IP address or domain. So um, being that we saw a lot of activity happening, network connections, calc, reg serve, all that, um, I want to touch on this real quick uh, before we go into actually techniques on the heat map. Uh, so back to the maturity model here. Um, Roberto broke this in here to begin to help you on your scores of what you're going to use on the heat map. Uh, so in this particular case, as you're going through the data and you're validating what you have controls for detection or prevention for, you can start to get to map where you are within your within all those criteria. Uh, so in this case, I don't have all my logs central, so it's probably a really bad thing. And if I'm hunting one endpoint at a time, I'm not being completely effective. Um, so more or less what he's saying is I need to get all my data into a good place. Um, centralized and begin to perform my threat hunting, uh, correlation, whatnot, somewhere. Uh, even if I'm using scripts, um, I could use Windows event forwarding and use PowerShell to dig through all of my Windows event logs, right? Um, anything's better than nothing. Um, so I'm going to hop over to the heat map. You can kind of see here it goes on about how you're collecting the right data, not just all the things, but you're collecting everything you need. So same with that sysmon config. Um, and write down correlating integrating different data types so you're looking at sysmon windows event logs and then carbon black response whatever it may be so back on the heat map here we had a couple things execute right we had a scheduled task for instance um, that was made so in case you made a scheduled task i'm going to go down here and say that i saw his scheduled task i'm going to put myself as a one it changes the colors similar to that score definition tab so um, and then I did see those red serve 32s happen, but again, I'm not centralizing my logging. Um, but in this case, for as an example, I'm just going to put a three because I want the color to change. <laughs> um, and then we had, right, we had a bunch of registry queries happening, and I actually don't have any watch list in Carbon Black looking for that right now. So I'm just going to leave that as a zero. Um, and it goes on, right? We're looking for WMIC, anything like that that's happening. You can go and pop these guys in there. Um, all those net executions, uh, all those Windows event logs, all those types of things that were generating events during that execution of that bat file is all going to play key into um, tracking here on your heat map. Uh, I'll go ahead and pause. I think I said a lot there. Uh, any, any questions, Casey? I haven't seen any questions come in at this point, Mike. Um, I, think, I think we're good so far. Excellent. Um, 
So yeah, as you begin to fill these in, whether you're doing this per lab, like per atomic test that you run, um, or you run a bunch of atomic tests and then you go back and you start to measure your progress on this, um, what you can do here, and this is the way the heat map works, is you just kind of highlight the rows, the numbers, you get your average score down here at the bottom with an Excel, you pop over to the trends tab here, and this is now where you can begin to see over time how you've been progressing. Um, and so Roberto gives it to us here by just different quarters. Now you can type in your um, average scores right here. Obviously, most likely you can <laughs> uh, have these tie in automatically, but you can begin to come in here and see where you've been progressing over time. And so he starts it off as <clears throat> pretty light at the beginning, and then over time you've gone up to a four and a half on your average in Q4, which leads to here on this nice little graph, the different MITRE TAC matrix pieces, um, and then also the scores right on there. Um, so a great thing to show management, your boss, how things have been progressing over time. Again, it's also something that you can use to test out new products, right? Um, that's probably one of the probably one of the higher use cases for the Atomic Red Team is validating new products, whether the product can detect or prevent, um, or with that new product, how it works within my full security stack. Uh, and so this spreadsheet. It is released, it is on our GitHub repo. Uh, so if you go back to the Atomic Red Team repo, it's down at the bottom, there's a link for it to Roberto's uh, website um, and also the blog that talks about this and the spreadsheets there. And also on our blog, uh, Red Canary Atomic Red Team blog, you'll see the link for this spreadsheet as well. Awesome, great stuff, Mike. Yeah, thank you, sir. There's a couple of questions that have come in here. Just uh, let's see here. Pull it up real quick. Uh, I think you addressed it. Some people asked about uh, have we automated the metrics with, with a sim uh, to automatically generate metrics? Oh. I guess as opposed to manually entering these into a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, I haven't yet. And that's all going to depend on the you know, the different SIM platforms. I, I don't know the best way we could do that for, for everyone at once, right? <laughs> yeah, I get, it's cool. probably going to depend on each environment, but we'd love to get feedback if somebody does create some tools to, to pull different SIMs or uh, products to populate this. That'd be great feedback. We'd love to see it. Uh, I think you, you answered the uh, Excel spreadsheet is actually, there's a question came in about the Excel spreadsheet. I think we've answered that. That's Roberto's. We'll provide a, a link to his blog where, that, where we pulled that from for sure. Okay. I think those are most of the questions. There are any other questions at this point for Mike on some of the, uh, the testing or measuring that we've seen? Okay, so uh, we want to, we're, we're closing in. Uh, this is what we wanted to present today. This is really just the uh, beginning of what we have in mind for atomic framework uh, testing. So, um, oh, looks like some questions are rolling in here as we, there's a question that came in, says, also, has there been any analytics ran against MITRE framework, uh, like in the MITRE car? Mm, I'm not, I'm not sure. That, that may be uh, something we'll have to follow up with. Uh, I'm not, not familiar with. Um, if, if any analytics have been run against that framework. There, there, there probably has, but I'm not sure. So I will follow up uh, after this to get you guys that information. It's a good question, Ryan. Thank you. Other questions that are coming in for us? Um, here's a good question, Casey. Yep. Um, what, uh, what other things do you see the future for within this project? What are, what are things coming down the pipe on the project? Sure, that's a good question. I think at this point, one of the things that we've looked at is especially expanding our attack chains for folks. So like maybe we want to uh, provide some attack chains that model after a particular actor. Uh, so take, take some group uh, that may be conducting activity. Maybe you want to look at like uh, APT32 that runs RedSurf32. Maybe you want to take some of their capabilities and see uh, how your telemetry collects if you were to go against that adversary. So um, that, that's one thing I have in mind. Um, the other things would be just continuing to expand coverage. We release the products and we know there's gaps in some of the techniques. So we would also be looking to expand where we, where we want different atomic tests to be added. 
uh, and also look to the community to provide feedback on maybe things they'd like to see or where we could add additional techniques. So uh, it's all open source. Um, just to bring up the link again so everybody has it, uh, if you're curious about where to find uh, the Atomic Red Team, you can go out to the Red Canary Get page. You'll also be some follow-up information from this uh, webinar too. So there's a couple different places we'll be able to provide information for that. So. Um, those are a couple things that I have in mind. I'm not sure, like Mike, if you'd like to speak to some other additional things, but those are the things I sort of have in mind, like creating more chain reactions, uh, getting expanded coverage on techniques, and looking for feedback from the community on where we can improve. Yeah, I, I think that that all hits it. And I know we want to try to get to the place where we have more adversary simulations and whatnot. Um, Roberto's been working on that within his uh, threat hunting playbook. Uh, repository. So converting those into just chain reactions and allowing that to uh, just be part of the project. I think, I think that would be awesome. Yeah, and just a just a reminder. You you guys are welcome as we as we expand this project. Uh, you can send an email to research at redcanary.com, and we'll be able to take that directly from you as a way to reach out to us and get additional feedback from you. Things you'd like to see, additional uh, collaboration on the project. So. I think, I don't think any other questions. Oh, we have more questions rolling in. All right, hold on. Bear with me as I get used to this panel here to try to find the questions. Uh, I wasn't scrolling down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question was, uh, any other recommendations aside from Carbon Black? Love the product, but an but answer from client clients is very expensive. Uh, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not going to speak to that at this point. I think we're, you know, this this framework is designed to test multiple different products so as far as making a recommendation uh, I, I would encourage you to go into the marketplace and see what might work best for you your size of your organization uh, we use carbon black here but there's certainly other solutions that are out there uh, that may work better for what you're looking for so I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that um, looks like another question came in here it says uh, in terms of testing solution how does the heat map allow you to differentiate between the threat blocked threat detected uh, threat information available and gathered for hunting. So that's a good question. Mike, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. And that's that's a solid question because that spreadsheet is very focused on threat hunting and maturity for threat hunting. Um, so yeah, the, the whole idea there is, is you will need to either build out the other sections within the spreadsheet um, or use it just as a way to validate, you know, you have the capabilities to detect um, or determine that threat was blocked, right? Um, it, we don't have it built in there today, but that's that's actually something we probably should really start looking into considering is adding on to that for Roberto and push that into his repo as well. Yeah, good question. Uh, another question came in said, are we looking at the possibility of some techniques to show the value of disrupting chains through the deception techniques and disruption log or detection capabilities? It's, it's something, uh, I'll go ahead and answer this one, it's something I'm certainly looking at. Uh, I think as an adversary, if you land an environment and you know your telemetry is being studied, there's certainly value in disrupting, uh, degrading that performance of that telemetry. We don't have anything like that yet. I don't know. I'm not aware of any of those techniques in the MITRE framework, but that's certainly something maybe on the horizon uh, that we want to be thinking about. So how do you protect the integrity of this telemetry collection uh, on those endpoints? So that's a really good question. Uh, let's see, another question enrolled in said, uh, with well, certain APTs focusing on certain verticals, are there cases based upon those verticals, retail, government, healthcare, et cetera? So that's actually a really good question. That uh, kind of speaks to, we hope you uh, would be able to build these chain reactions that are specific to your industry. So uh, we, we don't have anything like that. So we don't have anything right now today that would say, hey, if, if you're in finance, these are the actors that you see and these are the tests that you could run. Uh, it, it may be something worth expanding. Mike and I can talk about that. It's, really good. it's a good idea, uh, but I'd also look to you um, as, as a defender. You know your industry best and, and collecting that information. So uh, really, good, really good question. We don't have anything like that today. So let's see. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions came in said, do we consider Sysmon EDR light? Um, I'm going to just uh, say it's a it's a place to begin, right? Uh, I'll let Mike maybe take that question on where, where he thinks it's positioned. But any visibility, my opinion, is any visibility is better than uh, nothing. And so it's really a good place to start. It may not work for every organization, but I'll let you take that, Mike. 
<laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, it absolutely it can be, right? I mean, with the right uh, type of infrastructure and, and everything like that, it, it could definitely help get you to a better place, you know, and, and eventually over time, you know, you may look to more of an enterprise product. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, data is data. You can at least begin to review and hunt through the things and have better detection than you did yesterday. Awesome. Okay, uh, a couple other questions have come in about different, uh, some different MITRE projects that are happening. Um, I'll try and follow up on those because I don't have information on those right now. So some good questions came in about additional projects that MITRE is working on. Uh, again, I would probably point you to just to make sure that you're checking out the MITRE page, that they're, they own that framework, uh, and that may be a good place to drive more information. The, the things that we're sort of doing here are related to taking that and allowing you to run some tests and sort of seed those logs and, and get some telemetry back. So hopefully that answers that question. I'll, I'll provide some follow-up in the email that comes out after this. So it looks like I don't see any other questions at this point. So hopefully this has been helpful um, for everybody. So please provide any feedback to us, to Mike and myself at research at redcanary.com. Uh, any other closing thoughts, Mike? I think we're doing okay on time, so. Yeah, um, I know the uh, this webinar is recorded, so it will follow up after this. And the PowerPoint slide will be there. Um, there wasn't much in the PowerPoint piece, but at least the webinar will have the actual of um, all the different labs we ran through. Um, and then also the pieces for um, the, the bat files, they will be on the repo here pretty soon. Uh, so you guys can go down, go download them, you know, or fork the repo and execute them out of your own. Um, play, from, play with those things and build your own chain reactions. Um, if you build your own chain reactions, please, please push them back. We'd love to have that community feedback and participation, adding new things into this repository. Um, but yeah, that's all. This is this is great. Thank you, guys. Yep, and yeah, just you touched on something, Mike. I just want to make sure we sort of go on the record and say is that don't. Uh, it's not a good idea to run code directly off a, a Git repo that you don't control. Uh, so we've been running these directly off of our our Red Canary uh, in our example. But uh, we definitely encourage you to to bring this down locally, host it somewhere internally where you can control the tests and things like that. It's all open source for you to do what you want. Uh, but generally, best practice would be don't just run code from somebody's Git repo that you don't have ownership of. So just, just to make sure we get that out there. Okay, well, thanks again, everybody, for your time. Um, we look forward to doing this again. We'll keep you posted on some things that we're looking for working down the, uh, in the future. Uh, really appreciate your time. Again, research at Red Canary for feedback uh, from Mike and I, and uh, hopefully this has been very helpful. Thanks again. Talk to you soon.